it, the certain word. Salvation is the saving grace of God manifested through Jesus Christ, whose atoning and vicarious death satisfied the absolute and perfect justice of God. For God's grace to be manifested, his justice had to be satisfied because sin requires death. God had declared to man that disobedience to his word would lead to death, Genesis 2.17. But man chose to doubt that word. Not only man's subsequent history, but also the vicarious death of Christ emphasised that God's word is an assured or certain word and that sin is inescapably linked to death. Not only does God's absolute word require death for sin, but it also makes salvation possible and certain. To understand this, let us begin by examining the June 24th, 1969 entry in Rabbi Martin Siegel's diary. Quote, Several months ago, I talked to a couple who were feuding over whether to have a $15,000 bar mitzvah for their son. The father said he couldn't afford it and didn't want it. The mother said she wanted it whether the father could afford it or not. I urged her to have a small, modest affair. That will take courage, Rabbi, she said, but I'll try. She called me today to tell me that she had decided on a gala $15,000 spectacular. You'll drive your husband to bankruptcy, I said. But at least we'll be able to face our neighbours, she replied. The library in the community has been running a film called The Answer, which is about a riddle and one man's attempt to solve it. The riddle embodies all the problems of mankind in its solution, we find out in the end is no less than the Ten Commandments. Tonight I was invited to speak after the film. I told the group that I didn't believe in abstract universals like the Ten Commandments. The librarian was very upset, end quote. What Rabbi Siegel failed to see was that there was a connection between a denial of the Ten Commandments and the mother's attitude. If men are not governed by God, they will be governed by men and the opinions of men. Man's life is never lived without an assured and certain word, a principle of action and a guarantee of salvation. For all too many, this word is the opinion of men. In a situation not unlike that of Rabbi Siegel and the mother's expensive bar mitzvah, a woman justified a similar extravagance because it had, quote, helped, unquote, her husband and daughter. Her justification was existential. What can my action do to me here and now? Salvation for her was not a divine transaction, but any means of deliverance from evil and ruin. For her, moreover, evil and ruin meant any endangering of her totally humanistic and societal hopes for herself, her daughter and her husband. Salvation is a passion of man, but not necessarily a holy passion. As many men want deliverance from the necessity of righteousness as there are who look to be delivered from sin and evil. The cry is for deliverance, for redemption, release and preservation but very often into goals which are themselves evil and reprobate. The intense reaction of men to Christ is, We will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19.14 Man wants salvation from the certain word of God unto the open word of man, to man's uncertain word. The sin of man was his acceptance of the creature's word as against the word of God. The declaration of the serpent was, Yea, hath God said, Genesis 3.1. The salvation of man was declared to be the lack of any absolute and certain word of God. The world was held to be one of open possibilities, a universe in which man could make and unmake reality at his will. Men shall be their own gods, deciding what is good and evil as they choose, and in terms of their needs at the moments and in their situation, Genesis 3.5. If the world were so, then there would be no word above and over man to judge man. 
men resent an infallible and certain word over and above them which judges them. For sinful men, the cut-off point of the tolerable world is themselves. Thus, a report of the attitudes of male homosexual prostitutes describes them as, quote, true existentialists, end quote, living only in terms of the moment. Moreover, quote, most seem to feel that it was not terribly different from any other job. Some made the point that everybody hustles and that everybody has a price. The difference, they say, is wholly in degree, end quote. The rise of occultism and Satanism is closely tied to this. These prostitutes rationalise their way of life first by denying that any higher way or law exists. If there be no God, then anything and everything is permissible. Man is bound by no law, and prostitution is then as quote-unquote honourable a profession as medicine. At the same time, all things are equally quote-unquote base, since now there is no criterion whereby anything can be called truly and objectively good or evil. The possibility of judgment is thus negated. Second, because the sense of guilt will not disappear, the means of justification used by these prostitutes is to say that, quote, everybody hustles and that everybody has a price, end quote. All things being reduced to the same level by the denial of an absolute standard, all things are declared to be equally tinted. The thief declares that all men are thieves, the liar insists that all men are liars, and the prostitute says that, quote, everybody hustles, end quote. There is, in this perspective, no reality or truth above us. Quote, we will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19.14 Only a reality below us, and this means occultism and Satanism. Although there is much in occultism which frightens its followers, there is also much in it that delights them. Guilty men are defeated men and are defeatists. They have, as Warner and Reek and others have shown, a masochistic urge to self-punishment, defeat and mass destruction. Whereas occultism and Satanism masquerade as cults of power and victory, their essence is a cosmic defeatism. The universe is a perverse, meaningless and twisted place, a world of darkness and of devious power. Man's only hope in such a cosmos is a fleeting victory over others, an advantage, really, rather than a victory, and man's final end is darkness, death, or the shadows. Men who deny God have denied themselves victory, and for them it is comforting to believe that the universe ultimately denies victory and climaxes in death, with man dead, the sun cold and gone, and the universe run down. God is then replaced in their vision by the prince of defeat, Satan. Eliphas Levi, Alphonse Louis Constant, an occultist, has said of Satan that, quote, According to the Kabbalists, the true name of Satan is that of Jehovah reversed, for Satan is not a black god, but the negation of deity. He is the personification of atheism and idolatry. The devil is not a personality for initiates, but a force created with a good object, though it can be applied to evil. It is really the instrument of liberty. End quote. For such a perspective, God is Satan, and Satan, instead of being a person, is a force, a negation of God, quote, the instrument of liberty. End quote. Liberation means freedom from God. Levi's quest is for the, quote, secret of omnipotence, end quote. Moreover, the secret of the occult sciences is that nature herself, it is the secret of the generation of angels and worlds, it is that of God's own omnipotence. Quote, ye shall be as the Elohim, knowing good and evil, end quote. So testified the serpent of Genesis, and so did the tree of knowledge become the tree of death. For 6,000 years, the martyrs of science have toiled and perished at the foot of this tree so that it may become once more the tree of life. That absolute which is sought by the foolish and found only by the wise is the truth, the reality and the reason of universal equilibrium. 
Such equilibrium is the harmony which proceeds from the analogy of opposites. Humanity has sought so far to balance itself as if on one leg, now on one and now again on the other. Blind believers and sceptics are on a par with each other and both are equally remote from eternal salvation. Light is the equilibrium between shadow and brightness. Motion is the equilibrium between inertia and activity. Authority is the equilibrium between liberty and power. Wisdom is the equilibrium in thought. Virtue is equilibrium in the affections. Beauty is the equilibrium in form. Whatsoever is true is beautiful. All that is beautiful should be true. Heaven and hell are the equilibrium of moral life. Good and evil are the equilibrium of liberty. End quote. Omnipotence is the goal, and it is attained by quote-unquote equilibrium. Practically, what this equilibrium means is a reduction of all things to an equality. Good and evil placed in equilibrium free man from both good and evil in that they are now equally important, equally true, and equally meaningless. Both the believer and the sceptic give way to the man who is beyond both. He is too busy realising his own supposed omnipotence to be troubled by belief or doubt concerning the universe, especially since nothing in that universe, or beyond it, is now an object of belief, since man is his own ultimate. But man is his own ultimate in a meaningless universe with nothing save the quest for power and omnipotence to replace the loss of God's certain world. Levi affirmed all quote-unquote truths and thereby denied them all, because none for him had any objective value, but only a utility for man in his ascent to power. In a world beyond good and evil, a world without God, man must forsake the quest for meaning because he lives in a meaningless universe. He must also forsake any desire for godly dominion, since he recognises no god who bestows it and who establishes the terms of authority and ownership. Instead, his quest is for power, and the result is occultism and demonism. According to Levi, quote, It is by conformity with the rules of eternal power that man may unite himself to the creative energy and become creator and perseverer in his turn. End quote. Since this, quote, creative energy, end quote, in a godless universe is below, in the primeval energy of evolution, man must then look below to the primitive, magical, demonic, and the immoral for power and energy. When God's certain, infallible, and perfect word is denied, man has no word left to give meaning to life, and no word whereby he is commissioned to exercise dominion. As a result, man seeks salvation in power. Against the hovering demons of darkness and death, he has no protection except a fleeting assertion of power. Thus, every age of unbelief is also an era of power politics, tyranny and brutal death. Man seeks to substitute power for meaning and dominion, and his use of power is murderous. Levi called for the seizure of, quote, creative energy, end quote, but the energy exercised by man, the magician, turns life into death. As a result, in humanism, words which speak of a realm of meaning give way to power, and the results of the exercise of humanistic power, death. The more consistently humanistic the state, the greater its contempt as witness the Soviet Empire and Red China for words, the greater its reliance on lies and on terroristic power. As against this, Jesus Christ declared, in foretelling the fall of Jerusalem and the history of the Christian era to the end of history, that, quote, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew twenty four thirty five. This is a most remarkable sentence. The deliberate idiots who insist on seeing Jesus as one who never claimed to be God choose to disregard such statements. Lenski's comment on the force of this declaration is telling, quote, The statements that, quote, The heaven and the earth shall pass away, 
that my word shall in no wise pass away, end quote, loses much of its force when it is regarded as an assurance of the fact that the contemporaneous generation of Jews will not have disappeared before all things foretold by Jesus shall have reached an end. The statement gains in force when the prophecy of verse 34 is properly understood. This verse is only one of Jesus' words. Jesus does not restrict this statement to his present discourse and to the many statements it includes. He does not say, quote, these my words, end quote, but all-inclusively, quote, my words shall in no wise pass away, end quote. Despite their apparent durability, the physical heaven and earth, quote, shall pass away, end quote. But the words of Jesus will never undergo even the slightest change, either in meaning or in form, end quote. Let us examine the implications of the statement. Its implications concerning the person of Jesus are very great, as well as with respect to his word. First, Jesus very clearly declares that his word is the fundamental and creative word. All things are made by him, John 1.3, and they exist only as long as he decrees their existence. As a result, all things else can pass away, but his word shall not pass away. Jesus Christ is the Word who speaks the creative Word which brings all things into being. Quote, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John 1 3. Second, not only did Jesus Christ, as the second person of the Trinity, create all things, but He also predestined all things from eternity. As a result, he speaks in Matthew 24 and in all his word as the sovereign and predestinating Lord of all things. Not a sparrow falls unplanned in this universe where the very hairs of our head are all numbered. Matthew 10, 29 and 30. Because this is a fallen world, it is often a grim battlefield, a place of grief and trouble. It is, however, also a world of victory and salvation where God's predestined purposes absolutely govern and decree all things. The world is never out of control for the triune God, but controlled to the minutest and most far-reaching detail. It is a world, therefore, of total meaning, because it is a world of total government. Third, Jesus Christ, in declaring that his word shall not pass away, was speaking, among other things, about the future. That future is absolutely determined by him. Nothing can alter his decree. All things have meaning and reward in relationship to himself and his purpose. As a result, he could declare, quote, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no way lose his reward. Matthew 10, 42. Quote, Ye have done it unto me, end quote, Jesus said, Matthew 25, 37 and 40. So small a favour done to us is easily forgotten, but God, being total in his government, nothing is unimportant in his world, and as a result, total government means total reward. A cup of cold water gains a reward, even if it is given only in the name of a disciple of Christ. In Matthew 10, 41 and 42, three groups are distinguished, prophets, righteous men, and little ones or ordinary disciples. Quote, but there is no distinction as regards the reward, which, as Chrysostom said, is eternal life. A cup of cold water is a proverbial expression for a minor service. End quote. Chrysostom's view of the nature of the reward need not be accepted, but the fact of a full reward is very evident. Clearly, the word of Christ is the word of true power because it is the word of dominion. Quote, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28, 18. His word is clearly the saving word. Throughout his ministry, he declared men to be saved in terms of their relationship to him. Even in the agony of the cross, his word to the thief had total assurance of an absolute government and authority 
and the thief had the assurance of paradise that very day? Luke 23, 39-43 There was no doubt in the mind of the dying Jesus or the certainty of his word. Salvation is only possible in a universe in which our God and Saviour speaks an unchanging and certain word. Salvation is not possible against a background of brute factuality, only against a framework of total meaning and the total authority of our Saviour can salvation have any significance. Only he who pronounces a word which will not pass away and whose every word has total authority can be man's Lord and Saviour.